In this video we'll be covering the basics of ESD protection as well as looking at TVS diodes. We'll cover a few different aspects. First of all we'll look at what ESD or surge protection even is. Then we'll look at TVS diode operation, one of the most common methods of preventing ESD strikes causing damage to any components on your PCB. When we're concerned with TVS diodes, we also need to examine various TVS diode parameters, which we'll need to choose depending on our scenario. Finally, we'll look at a real world hardware design and how to choose a suitable TVS diode, as well as looking at critical aspects of the PCB design and layout. Thank you very much to Altium for sponsoring this video. If you'd like to give Altium Designer a try for yourself, make sure to check out the link in the description below or go to altium.com forward slash yt forward slash Phil's lab to get yourself an Altium Designer free trial. If you're new to Altium Designer, also make sure to check out my video number 41 on the channel, which is a complete walkthrough of Altium Designer and SCM32 based PCB design. ESD or electrostatic discharge is effectively a sudden release of electricity from one charge object to another when these objects come into contact. One of the most common examples is if, for example, a person walks over a carpet, charges themselves up with static electricity, then touches an electrical conductor and therefore releases this charged energy in the form of an ESD spike. These ESD spikes can reach voltages of several kilovolts and therefore can be very harmful to electronics, and in particular integrated circuits. Integrated circuits are typically very sensitive to electrostatic discharge because ESD protection is not usually included, and if it is, only to a small extent in ICs because this protection takes up quite a lot of silicon real estate. Therefore, we need to often place external ESD protection. ICs are typically interfaced with the outside world via connectors, and we need to place ESD protection pretty much right at the connectors for reasons we'll see later. One of the most common ways of protecting against ESD strikes and surges is via the use of TVS diodes, or ESD diodes. In the left diagram at the bottom here, you can see a connector going straight through with a trace to an integrated circuit. And for any real world design, anything that's going to be put into production and commercial or industrial use, this is not the way to do it. What we want to do is place effectively in parallel one of these TVS diodes, and this is one symbol for a bi-directional TVS diode, effectively on the line or in parallel with the connector and the integrated circuit. And we'll go into more detail now. Let's first of all look at the very basics of how a TVS diode operate in an ideal case. During normal operation, let's assume we have a connector and an integrated circuit and they are talking to each other, so to speak. So we might have a microcontroller interfacing with a different PCB via connector. This might be running at 3.3 volts and we have our logic signals traveling along this trace. In this ideal case, the diode simply will appear as an open circuit. So it'll be invisible both to the connector and invisible to the integrated circuit. However, let's assume this person who's been shuffling over a carpet then touches a connector and causes an ESD strike. The diode we want to appear as a complete short circuit. So shunting all of this ESD energy directly to ground and therefore preventing any of this energy from reaching the integrated circuit. When choosing TVS diodes and when examining them further, we need to be concerned with several main parameters and we'll go through each of them in detail. So don't worry if this all looks a bit overwhelming. First of all, there's uni or bidirectional. On the right here, you can see the symbol for a bidirectional TVS diode. Then we need to choose the number of channels, the working voltage, clamping voltage, capacitance, and some sort of IEC rating, which turns out to be some sort of robustness rating. Let's go through them one by one. Let's start off with the directionality of a TVS diode. There are two types. One is unidirectional with the symbol shown on the right here, and the other is bidirectional. The directionality has predominantly to do with two facts. The unidirectional diode has an symmetrical IV curve, and more importantly, it's best suited for protecting signal lines that are always above or below the reference. So one side of this diode will usually be connected to ground and the other side to the signal line. Depending on the polarity of this diode, we either have positive valued signals with respect to ground or negative valued signals with respect to ground. We could also use a bidirectional TVS diode. This in comparison has a symmetrical IV curve and is best suited for protecting signal lines that can swing above or below the reference. So again, one side of this diode will be connected to reference, typically ground, and the other side to the signal line. Here this is illustrated a bit further graphically. So if we have a TVS diode unidirectional connected in this fashion right on the left here, we assume only positive valued signals with respect to ground. The middle image where we have the diode flipped, we are assuming only negative valued working signals with respect to ground. And then we have this bidirectional TVS diode where we're expecting both polarities with respect to ground. 
Secondly, we have the number of channels, and this is really easy. It's simply the number of TVS diodes contained in a single package. The reason we have multiple channels is that some of these TVS diodes manufactured will be packaged for various interfaces. So you might get some high-speed TVS diodes specifically for HDMI. So these might have four channels or eight channels. USB 2 might have two channels for data, one channel for power, and so on. Next, we have the working voltage, and this is one of the most important parameters to choose for proper operation of a TVS diode. In effect, it's the recommended operating voltage of the TVS diode. So the signal voltage should not exceed the working voltage. For example, if our integrated circuit is a microcontroller running at 3.3 volts and it's communicating via I2C to a connector and an off-board device, we want the working voltage of the TVS diode to be 3.3 volts at a minimum. Then we have the clamping voltage. And as the name suggests, the clamping voltage is relevant when an ESD strike occurs. Essentially, the ESD strike might be at several kilovolts, but the TVS diode at that point when the transient or the surge occurs will aim to clamp that voltage to whatever the clamping voltage is of that diode. So that might be 12 volts, 15, 20 volts, and so on. Now you might think, okay, this exceeds the 3.3 volts that our device is capable of, but it turns out that ICs are typically rated at a certain transmission line pulse or TLP rating. This is different to the absolute maximum rating you'll see on data sheets. The TLP rating, however, is quite hard to find for most ICs, at least in the data sheets. So it usually pays off to try and find a TVS diode with a small clamping voltage as possible. Next, we have the capacitance. Unfortunately, we live in a non-ideal world, and as is the case with any real diode, this diode will have some capacitance. Now, for DC signals or low-speed signals such as I2C or so on, this is of little importance. However, for high-speed interfaces, this can be quite a problem. TI, for example, ranges its TVS diodes in these three sections. Ultra-low capacitance, which is less than 0.5 picofarads. Low, anywhere from 0.5 to 1.5 picofarads. And general purpose, which is anything above 1.5 picofarads. The capacitance plays a huge role for high-speed interfaces, as any capacitance on the line, especially for higher switching speeds or lower rise and fall times, any capacitance will excessively load the drivers. In addition, the capacitance on bus will decrease rise and fall times, so you might have signal integrity issues, and so on. Therefore, we want to choose low capacitance TVS diodes for high-speed interfaces, so HDMI, USB 2, USB 3, and so forth. Another way of looking at this is that we have a sort of driver, which has a source impedance, maybe in combination with the transmission line, and we have a TVS diode. The TVS diode has a capacitance, and therefore our source impedance with this capacitance of the diode form a low pass filter, which isn't great in a lot of high speed cases. The last parameter we have to be concerned with is the IEC 61000-4-2 rating, which is quite a mouthful. We won't go over much detail on this video, but effectively it's the robustness rating of our protection device. And what rating we need is very much design dependent. And here's a table, credit to the Wikipedia page on the IEC standard, which gives us various levels and what contact and air discharge ratings these devices will have. So a higher IEC rating gives us a higher level of protection or robustness. We're almost ready to move over to choosing a suitable TVS diode for a particular application and then looking at how I've done that on a PCB layout. There's not too much to the PCB layout as long as you adhere to certain rules. The order we want to keep is that we want the connector, essentially on the edge of the PCB, directly adjacent to it and as close as possible we want the ESD protection. If we're using any filtering for EMI purposes that will come next after the ESD protection and then traces leading to the IC or whatever device you're connecting to. ESD protection should be as close as reasonable and as possible to the relevant connector. And we want to use low inductance connections. So for example, the ground or the reference connection needs to be short and wide, ideally with a via down to a nice low inductance ground plane, for example. Here we now are in Altium Designer and I have one of my recent projects open, which is a digital audio effects processor based on an SM32H7 microcontroller. The board is typically powered by this Molex Pika blade, anywhere from 9 to 12 volts, but can alternatively be powered through this USB-C connection on the right side here. Looking at the power input schematic, first of all, we have the Molex Pika blade connector with power and ground. And the first thing we see in line, and as I described earlier, is a TVS diode. Now, if it's unidirectional, I would place it this way around. If it's bidirectional, the polarity really doesn't matter. TVS diode comes first, then I have some sort of reverse polarity protection, as well as essentially oaring with the USB input connection over here. 
So TVA style it first, any reverse polarity prediction afterwards, and then I have this filtering network in terms of a pi filter, two capacitors and a ferric bead. So this order is critical. If we place the TVS diode, for example, after the filter, all the ESD energy needs to be absorbed by this network over here, including this Schottky diode and this capacitor and this ferrite bead, and more than likely this will damage at least the diode. Moving over to the layout, we have our power input connector here, and on the bottom side, this is a through-hole connector, and as you can see, as close as possible, I've placed this TVS diode to these pins, and I've moved a bit further away because I still want to be able to solder on this connector as, as well as these surrounding components. In 2D view, if I switch to the bottom side, my connector, I have my power input VCC and my ground over here, and I'm using thick wide traces going directly into this TVS diode. So wide traces, short to minimize my inductance and keeping it very close to the connector. So as you can see, there's not too much to placing and connecting TVS diodes, but let's see how they're chosen. We already saw that we have a VCC input voltage of between 9 and 12 volts. So this gives us an indication of our working voltage. We can't choose 9 volts as our working voltage, we have to choose the maximum expected input voltage. So we need a working voltage of 12 volts, maybe a bit more. It's a DC line, we're not really concerned about capacitance, we can choose any sort of capacitance diode we find, but we are concerned about how many channels we have. We just need a single channel. We can choose unidirectional or bidirectional, we are only expecting positive voltage with respect to ground. However, this connection might be flipped. We might have a reverse polarity, so it might be better to choose a bidirectional diode. The diode I've actually chosen here, although the symbol isn't entirely correct, it happens to actually be a bidirectional diode for exactly that reason. The clamping voltage will be hard to find or hard to determine. I have some various regulators connected. One of these regulators happens to be this Texas Instruments TLV low dropout regulator. And if we look at the data sheet and scroll down a bit, we can see absolute maximum ratings, and this is something you'll find in pretty much every data sheet, and we happen to see that the maximum input voltage is 18 volts, which might lead you to assume that this is also the maximum TLP rating for this device, but it actually turns out that this isn't. It also turns out that this data sheet doesn't contain this information, and this is the best guess we have. So ideally we want a clamping voltage that's 18 volts maximum. We can now go to your preferred distributor. I happen to use Mouser quite a bit, and under circuit protection and then ESD suppressors and TVS diodes, we'll use the filters to find a suitable diode. I'll check in stock, and I'll choose ESD suppressors and TVS diodes. Bidirectional or not, I don't really care for the moment, but I do care about my working voltage, which should be 12 volts minimum. I only want one channel, and I want it to be an SMD part. Another aspect is, of course, the package or the size of this TVS diode. For space constraint, you might want to go with 0402 or 0603, but also the parameters, working voltages, and so on will influence what packages you can get that in. Next, we have the clamping voltage. So we can scroll down and see we wanted 18 volts maximum, which we can get here. But for example, we could also go with 14 volts, which may give us a bit more safety. But I'll just select 18 volts and select the less than filter so we can see all the results. So let me click apply filters. And here we can see all the suitable TVS diodes that we could use, for example, in this design. If I just open up the first one, just as an example, then look at the data sheet, we can see this is a bidirectional TVS diode from the symbol over here. It has ESD protection up to plus minus eight kilovolts. And again, this is the robustness rating from our standard. The working voltage, also known as VRWM, is given at 12 volts, and we have various values for power dissipation and current dissipation. This is an 0603 SOD 962 package, so fairly small, which seems nice, and we have various parameters we can inspect over here as well, as well as the capacitance of the device, which is 10 picofarads maximum. So this might not be suitable for a high-speed line, but it's definitely suitable for a DC line. So thank you very much for watching this video. I hope it was useful and I hope you can incorporate some of these tips into your own hardware designs. If you haven't already, please do leave a like or a comment and make sure to subscribe to the channel for future videos. Thank you again and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.